of Soy Chord Play. This is the Chords of the Foo Fighters. And of course, we're going to be talking about Dave Grohl. And the Foo Fighters formed in Seattle, Washington in 1994, following Kurt Cobain's death and, you know, when Nirvana disbanded. And they've gone on to become one of the most popular rock bands in recent history. You know, they've won 12 Grammy Awards. They've had successful, you know, singles and albums and tours. Definitely a very, you know, popular band. And Dave Grohl himself has gone on to become one of the most influential rock musicians in the last 20 years. Over the years, I've talked to a lot of people about either Nirvana, Foo Fighters, or Dave Grohl himself. And, you know, whether it's just complete strangers or students or, you know, friends or whatever people I worked with or band, you know, band members or whatever. I've had a lot of conversations about these three, you know, entities, Nirvana, Foo Fighters, and Dave Grohl. And you really can kind of separate the three. I'm not really a big Nirvana fan. I respect, you know, their legacy and everything. Just not really a fan, a fan of that style of music, the kind of sludgy, you know, grungy kind of alt-punk or whatever you want to call it. But then once Dave kind of stepped out with, you know, Foo Fighters, it caught my ear because it was a little bit more melodic. It wasn't quite as abrasive and noisy, you know, and I kind of liked it. And then over the years, I've really, you know, grown to appreciate him and his approach and his sense of humor. I mean, he's worked with everybody. So even if you don't like Nirvana or Foo Fighters, I mean, his Probot project with heavy metal singers was awesome. I mean, they were basically death metal singers. Uh, Lemmy was on there. I mean, that's a great album. Uh, Queens of the Stone Age, you know, Them Crooked Vultures with John Paul Jones. But here's an image with a bunch of people that Dave Grohl's worked with. You know, it's really impressive. Aside from Dave's, you know, musicianship and his personality and his sense of humor, which I admire all those things, um, there are a lot of quotes, like either at award shows or interviews or, you know, television or whatever, where he's given his, you know, kind of vantage point or his view on music and, you know, young musicians and, you know, starting a band and all these different things, American Idol, he's, he's definitely shared, you know, his opinion and quotes related to all those things. So here's a quote from the Grammy Awards, I think this was in 2012, and I really liked, you know, what he had to say about, you know, modern music and modern musicians. I mean, this is great. Aside from featuring Foo Fighters music in this episode, we're also going to be looking at uh, non-diatonic chord progressions. So in other episodes on this channel, we've talked about diatonic progressions, and we've actually featured, you know, some non-diatonic progressions in other episodes. Some of the 90s, you know, kind of alternative and grunge episodes I've already made. Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, you know, Pearl Jam and some of those bands. Some of the metal stuff. But non-diatonic, you can definitely find it, you know, in lots of rock, hard rock and metal, jazz and classical, experimental music. I mean, it's around, definitely. So here's an image with definitions of diatonic and non-diatonic just to help you understand what we're talking about here. The opening that was the song Next Year from There's Nothing Left to Lose album. That's one of my favorite Foo Fighters songs. And while it wasn't a giant hit, um, you know, chord play really isn't about hit songs. It's about chords, and that's why I chose this song. But I do like the song itself. And it loosely reminds me of the worm section from Starship Trooper, you know, from Yes. And in that song, we actually looked at that in the Yes chord play episode, so we have talked about that part. But in that song, you know, Steve Howe's basically moving a C form like this. <laughs> kind of like that, but it's a little different. chords are really interesting too. So that's a G5 right here. So just think of C major but take your middle finger off and open up that D string with the open G. So that's G5 and you're going to move that down a half step, you know, the fretted portion, keep the open D and open G string. And then that's an F sharp flat 6 flat 9, which is really cool. It's like ear candy, you know, it's like yeah. F sharp, flat six, flat nine, and then that's gonna transfer down here to C major. 
And, you know, there's actually two guitars playing there. One is just banging on a C major chord, and you can hear the other one's kind of moving. So I kind of combine those two parts together to recreate it, you know, on one guitar like this. <laughs> there you're really just playing with C major and C sus2 you know open up that D string and then the last time you're gonna do this There, you're gonna move down, um, you know, hit that C a couple times, and then go to A7, and then C major, and then this is a what D, uh, what D add nine, add eleven. You know, one of my favorite chords. You can hear that in tons of songs, either parts of it or the whole thing. Uh, I think Pink Floyd and Def Leppard. You know, you're in the right ballpark there. And then you're gonna end on this G, and make sure you add the pinky there which is technically the same chord that you hear in uh, The Worm from Yes. Right? So one more time here. kind of airy sound with those chords and it has a dreamy uh, kind of flavor to it. The next example is from the song Times Like These which is from the One by One album and this is a great example of what happens when you leave your guitar over at your drummer's house because the next thing you know they're gonna write a song like this. So it starts with this really unusual chord kind of a quirky rhythm and that's an all in 4-4 and then you hear it shift the two guitars there's a single note riff and then a power chord riff but then that's in 7-4 so there's a noticeable shift in the time signature. But the opening chord is this. And that's a D13. And you also hear him kind of opening up that A string and kind of strumming it like this. And then you hear the guitars kind of split off. And guitar one, I'm gonna loop with a TC Electronic Diddle Looper, which is this part. So there's the riff, and that's in 7-4. So that's in 7-4, and the chord progression is going to be power chords. So it's D5, C5, to B5, but it's in 7-4, it's straight eighths, but it's going to be like this, and you have to count. Uh, I'm going to count it out loud so you can check it out. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and one and two and three and four and five and six and seven and one and two and three and four and five and six and seven and one. riffs like that where you hear the chord under the single note riff kind of move and then that makes the the single note riff kind of change the tonality and the flavor so cool next to the song breakout which is also from there's nothing left to lose album and this once again kind of showcasing this non-diatonic you know chord progression action and there's also a phaser so i kicked on the phase 95 but it's something like this <laughs> looked at these chords before in other episodes but this first chord it's basically a B at 11 so think of a B you know major bar chord but then open up the top part and you know play the B and the high E strings open and then move that over to this and there's just a giant E5 right there and then you're gonna sneak up here and that's gonna be a, a C sharp 7 
know, watch the high E string. I think it's okay if you play it, but that's actually a, you know, a dissonant string. But I have seen some footage of them playing this live, and they just strum it like the birds or somebody. But I think that's actually what you hear on the studio album. But watch that high E string, because it does create a little bit of tension, but luckily it moves to this, and that's just going to basically be a C major 7. So I like this little chromatic walk down. And that's obviously, you know, non-diatonic because that doesn't really happen uh, like in a normal, you know, major or minor key. But I do like that cycle of chords. You know, really cool and kind of different. You know, it's it's twisting your ear as it's moving down the fretboard. And next we have The Pretender, which is from the Echo, Silence, Patience, and Grace album. And this is really cool. It's another one of my favorite Foo Fighter songs. But the chord progression is so cool. There's like a little bend, like in the middle of one of the chords. Really cool, like this. So this is an A minor at 9 to start. And then you basically hear him change, you know, that root note. It's going to move around um, like this. Right? So you're kind of changing that uh, B. That's kind of like an A5 over B and then a C6. Go to this F sharp minor, uh, what F sharp minor seven flat five, and that's where the bend's gonna come in. You're gonna bend in that uh, F sharp up a half step to G, and then you're gonna basically keep everything the same but change the root note to F, and then now that's an F major seven. So you're slowly uh, going through it like this. Next we have the song White Lemma, which is from the Wasting Light album, and it's this aggressive and obnoxious and real punk and heavy uh, kind of chord riff. Totally sounds like he was working with Josh Holm. I don't know, is Josh Holm on the song? I think he might be, but uh, something like this. <laughs> starts with this implied it's a B flat 9 is what's going on right there you know really tense and dissonant and ugly you know flat 9 chords are usually especially if they're arranged that way uh, they have a, a tendency of being kind of ugly or, or harsh but then a jazz guitarist hands I mean jazz guitarists use flat 9 chords all the time and you barely even notice the dissonance but with that one it's on full display you know where it's like listen to this so that's a B major chord, but you've added that C right there, which is your flat nine. And it's implied, but he's doing, um... And that's just kind of like little partial chords. And then power chords. So it's like A, B, B, C, B, A, C. And then you want to accent that last C back to that weird, you know, B-flat-9 riff. And the second time there, you're going to do everything the same, but you're going to end on this F5 over C. 
stack power chords once again right there, but uh, something like this. <laughs> And if you're looking for something to annoy your neighbors with, that's the perfect riff right there. Just crank it up and drive your neighbors crazy. Right, the last example is the very popular Everlong. I've shown this to hundreds, if not, you know, a thousand students or whatever over the years. Had lots of requests for this song. Uh, it's from the Color and the Shape album. And we're in drop D too, so it's the only one that's in a different tuning. But we've got this. <laughs> which is really crafty because there's your D, F sharp, and C sharp. So it's really just three notes of that four note chord, but it's implying, you know, D major seven. And then you're going to move over to this. And that's basically a B sus two. You want to move that down to the fifth fret and then drop D. That's now a G sus two right here. And then go back to that B sus two. So it's something like this. play with the chords of Foo Fighters and I'm definitely a Dave Grohl fan. I find him very interesting. He's extremely talented. He's got a great sense of humor. He also seems to be a good actor, you know, on television and in movies and even in his uh, music videos too. Just quirky and random and goofy. But I'm quirky and random and goofy so as soon as I noticed him I thought, hey, he kind of reminds me of me but he's a lot more famous and he's a lot funnier and he can definitely play drums well, you know, well beyond my skills. I can do like an ACDC beat but Dave Grohl definitely, I mean, he's a killer drummer, a great front man, you know, a solid guitarist and just a good songwriter. And from what I understand, what I've read, he's the most anti-rock star rock star on the planet. I mean, he's definitely a rock star, but he doesn't act like one. You know, he's constantly pulling people up on stage and handing them a guitar or he's doing like free impromptu, you know, unannounced concerts for people. And um, what he recorded an entire album in music cities all across you know the United States and that's so cool where it's like okay he's he's beyond the fame and the money or whatever he just loves music and it's obvious he does and he also loves good jokes too but uh, you know he loves the music just pouring out of them so anyway leave some feedback and some comments please subscribe to Light Lessons and I'll be back before you know it with more content and material thank you